Chapter 12 I am gone, sire, and anon, sire, I will be with you again. Twelfth Night The Hurons stood aghast at this sudden visitation of death on one of their band, but as they regarded the fatal accuracy of a name which had dared to immolate an enemy at so much hazard to a friend, the name of Le Long Carabine burst simultaneously from every lip, and was succeeded by a wild and a sort of plaintive howl. The cry was answered by a loud shout from a little thicket where the incautious party had piled their arms, and at the next moment Hawkeye, too, eager to load the rifle he had regained, was seen advancing upon them, brandishing the clubbed weapon and cutting the air with wide and powerful sweeps. Bold and rapid as was the progress of the scout, it was succeeded by that of a light and vigorous form which, bounding past him, leaped with incredible activity and daring into the very center of the Hurons, where it stood, whirling a tomahawk and flourishing a glittering knife with fearful menaces in front of Kara. Quicker than the thoughts could follow those unexpected and audacious movements, an image armed in the emblematic panoply of death glided before their eyes and assumed a threatening attitude at the other's side. The savage tormentors recoiled before these warlike intruders and uttered as they appeared in such quick succession the often repeated and peculiar exclamations of surprise, followed by the well-known and dreaded appellation of Le Sophagile, Le Gros Serpin. But the wary and vigilant leader of the Hurons was not so easily disconcerted. Casting his keen eyes around the little plain, he comprehended the nature of the assault at a glance, and encouraging his followers by his voice as well as by his example, he unsheathed his long and dangerous knife and rushed with a loud whoop upon the expected Chingachgook. It was the signal for a general combat. Neither party had firearms, and the contest was to be decided in the deadliest manner, hand to hand, with weapons of offense and none of defense. Uncas answered the whoop, and, leaping on an enemy with a single well-directed blow of his tomahawk, cleft him to the brain. Hayward tore the weapon of Magua from the sapling and rushed eagerly toward the fray. As the combatants were now equal in number, each singled an opponent from the adverse band. The rush and blows passed with the fury of a whirlwind and the swiftness of lightning. Hawkeye soon got another enemy within reach of his arm, and with one sweep of his formidable weapon he beat down the slight and inartificial defenses of his antagonist, crushing him to the earth with the blow. Hayward ventured to hurl the tomahawk he had seized, too ardent to await the moment of closing. It struck the Indian he had selected on the forehead and checked for an instant his onward rush. Encouraged by this slight advantage, the impetuous young man continued his onset and sprang upon his enemy with naked hands. A single instant was enough to assure him of the rashness of the measure, for he immediately found himself fully engaged with all his activity and courage in endeavoring to ward the desperate thrusts made with the knife of the Huron. Unable longer to foil an enemy so alert and vigilant, he threw his arms about him and succeeded in pinning the limbs of the other to his side with an iron grasp, but one that was far too exhausting to himself to continue long. In this extremity he heard a voice near him shouting, "'Exterminate the varlets! No quarter to an accursed Mingo!' At the next moment, the breech of Hawkeye's rifle fell on the naked head of his adversary, whose muscles appeared to wither under the shock as he sank from the arms of Duncan, flexible and motionless. When Uncas had brained his first antagonist, he turned like a hungry lion to seek another. The fifth and only Huron, disengaged at the first onset, had paused a moment, and then, seeing that all around him were employed in the deadly strife, he had sought with hellish vengeance to complete the baffled work of revenge. Raising a shout of triumph, he sprang toward the defenseless Kara, sending his keen axe as the dreadful precursor of his approach. The tomahawk grazed her shoulder, and cutting the waves which bound her to the tree, left the maiden at liberty to fly. She eluded the grasp of the savage, and, reckless of her own safety, threw herself on the bosom of Alice, striving with convulsed and ill-directed fingers to tear asunder the twigs which confined the person of her sister. Any other than a monster would have relented at such an act of generous devotion to the best and purest affection— but the breast of the Huron was a stranger to sympathy. Seizing Kara by the rich tresses which fell in confusion about her form, he tore her from her frantic hold and bowed her down with brutal violence to her knees. The savage drew the flowing curls through his hand, and raising them on high with an outstretched arm, he passed the knife around the exquisitely molded head of his victim with a taunting and exulting laugh. But he purchased this moment of fierce gratification with the loss of the fatal opportunity. It was just then the sight caught the eye of Uncas. Bounding from his footsteps, he appeared for an instant, darting through the air, and descending in a ball, he fell on the chest of his enemy, driving him many yards from the spot, headlong and prostrate. The violence of the exertion cast the young Mohican at his side. They arose together, fought and bled, each in his turn. But the conflict was soon decided. The tomahawk of Hayward 
and the rifle of Hawkeye descended on the skull of the Huron at the same moment that the knife of Uncas reached his heart. The battle was now entirely terminated, with the exception of the protracted struggle between Le Renaud Subtil and Le Gros Subpin. Well did these barbarous warriors prove that they deserved those significant names which had been bestowed for deeds in former wars. When they engaged, some little time was lost in eluding the quick and vigorous thrusts which had been aimed at their lives. Suddenly, darting on each other, they closed and came to the earth, twisted together like twining serpents, in pliant and subtle folds. At the moment, when the victors found themselves unoccupied, the spot where these experienced and desperate combatants lay could only be distinguished by a cloud of dust and leaves which moved from the centre of the little plain towards its boundary, as if raised by the passage of a whirlwind. Urged by the different motives of filial affection, friendship, and gratitude, Hayward and his companions rushed with one accord to the place, encircling the little canopy of dust which hung above the warriors. In vain did Uncas dart around the cloud with a wish to strike his knife into the heart of his father's foe. The threatening rifle of Hawkeye was raised and suspended in vain, while Duncan endeavored to seize the limbs of the Huron with hands that appeared to have lost their power. Covered as they were with dust and blood, the swift evolutions of the combatants seemed to incorporate their bodies into one. The death-like looking figure of the Mohican and the dark form of the Huron gleamed before their eyes in such quick and confused succession that the friends of the former knew not where to plant the succoring blow. It is true there were short and fleeting moments when the fiery eyes of Magua were seen glittering like the fabled organs of the basilisk through the dusty wreath by which he was enveloped, and he read by those short and deadly glances the fate of the combat in the presence of his enemies. Ere, however, any hostile hand could descend on his devoted head, its place was filled by the scowling visage of Chingachgook. In this manner, the scene of the combat was removed from the center of the little plain to its verge. The Mohican now found an opportunity to make a powerful thrust with his knife. Magua suddenly relinquished his grasp and fell backward, without motion and seemingly without life. His adversary leaped on his feet, making the arches of the forest ring with the sounds of triumph. "'Well done for the Delawares! Victory to the Mohicans!' cried Hawkeye, once more elevating the butt of the long and fatal rifle. "'A finishing blow from a man without a cross will never tell against his honor, nor rob him of his right to the scalp.' But at the very moment, when the dangerous weapon was in the act of descending, the subtle Huron rolled swiftly from beneath the danger, over the edge of the precipice, and, falling on his feet, was seen leaping with a single bound into the center of a thicket of low bushes which clung along its sides. The Delawares, who had believed their enemy dead, uttered their exclamation of surprise, and were following with speed and clamor like hounds in open view of the deer, when a shrill and peculiar cry from the scout instantly changed their purpose, and recalled them to the summit of the hill. "'Twas like himself,' cried the inveterate forester, whose prejudices contributed so largely to veil his natural sense of justice in all matters which concerned the Mingos. A lying and deceitful varlet as he is. An honest Delaware now, being fairly vanquished, would have lain still and been knocked on the head. But these knavish mock was cling to life like so many cats in the mountain. Let him go. Let him go. Tis but one man, and he without rifle or bow, many a long mile from his French comrades— and like a rattler that lost his fangs, he can do no further mischief until such time as he and we too may leave the prince of our moccasins over a long reach of sandy plain. See, Uncas, he added in Delaware, your father is flaying the scalps already. It may be well to go round and feel the vagabonds that are left, or we may have another of them loping through the woods and screeching like a jay that has been winged. So saying, the honest but implacable scout made the circuit of the dead into whose senseless bosoms he thrust his long knife with as much coolness as though they had been so many brute carcasses. He had, however, been anticipated by the elder Mohican, who had already torn the emblems of victory from the unresisting heads of the slain. But Uncas, denying his habits, we had almost said his nature, flew with instinctive delicacy, accompanied by Hayward, to the assistance of the females, and quickly releasing Alice, placed her in the arms of Kara. We shall not attempt to describe the gratitude to the almighty disposer of events which glowed in the bosoms of the sisters who were thus unexpectedly restored to life and to each other. Their thanksgivings were deep and silent, the offerings of their gentle spirits burning brightest and purest on the secret altars of their hearts, and their renovated and more earthly feelings exhibiting themselves in long and fervent, though speechless, caresses. As Alice rose from her knees, where she had sunk by the side of Kara, she threw herself on the bosom of the ladder and sobbed aloud the name of their aged father while her soft, dove-like eyes sparkled with the rays of hope. "'We are saved. We are saved,' she murmured. 
to return to the arms of our dear, dear father, and his heart will not be broken with grief. And you too, Cora, my sister, my more than sister, my mother, you too are spared. And Duncan, she added, looking round upon the youth with a smile of ineffable innocence, even our own brave and noble Duncan has escaped without a hurt. To these ardent and nearly innocent words, Cora made no other answer than by straining the youthful speaker to her heart as she bent over her in melting tenderness. The manhood of Haywood felt no shame in dropping tears over this spectacle of affectionate rapture. Anuncus stood fresh and blood-stained from the combat, a calm and apparently an unmoved looker-on, it is true, but with eyes that had already lost their fierceness and were beaming with a sympathy that elevated him far above the intelligence and advanced him probably centuries before the practices of his nation. During this display of emotions so natural in their situation, Hawkeye, whose vigilant distrust had satisfied himself that the Hurons who disfigured the heavenly scene no longer possessed the power to interrupt its harmony, approached David and liberated him from the bonds he had until that moment endured with the most exemplary patience. "'There!' exclaimed the scout, casting the last wythe behind him. "'You are once more master of your own limbs, though you seem not to use them with much greater judgment than that in which they were first fashioned. If advice from one who is not older than yourself, but who, having lived most of his time in the wilderness, may be said to have experience beyond his years, will give no offence, you are welcome to my thoughts.' and these are to part with a little tooting instrument in your jacket to the first fool you meet with, and buy some weapon with the money, if it be only the barrel of a horseman's pistol. By industry and care you might thus come to some preferment, for by this time I should think your eyes would plainly tell you that a carrion crow is a better bird than a mocking thresher. The one will at least remove foul sights from before the face of man, while the other is only good to brew disturbances in the woods by cheating the ears of all that hear them." "'Arms and the clarion for the battle, but the song of thanksgiving to the victory,' answered the liberated David. "'Friend,' he added, thrusting forth his lean, delicate hand toward Hawkeye in kindness, while his eyes twinkled and grew moist, "'I thank thee that the hairs of my head still grow where they were first rooted by Providence. For though those of other men may be more glossy and curling, I have ever found mine own well suited to the brain they shelter.' that I did not join myself to the battle was less owing to disinclination than to the bonds of the heathen. Valiant and skilful hast thou proved thyself in the conflict, and I hereby thank thee for proceeding to discharge other and more important duties, because thou hast proved thyself well worthy of a Christian's praise. "'The thing is but a trifle, and what you may often see if you tarry long among us,' returned the scout, a good deal softened toward the man of song by this unequivocal expression of gratitude. "'I have got back.' "'My old companion Kildare,' he added, striking his hand on the breech of his rifle, "'and that in itself is a victory. "'These Iroquois are cunning, but they outwitted themselves "'when they placed their firearms out of reach, "'and had Uncas or his father been gifted with only their common Indian patience, "'we should have come in upon the knaves with three bullets instead of one, "'and that would have made a finish of the whole pack, "'yon loping varlet as well as his comrades. "'But twas all foreordered, and for the best. "'Thou sayest well,' returned David, and hast caught the true spirit of Christianity. He that is to be saved will be saved, and he that is predestined to be damned will be damned. This is the doctrine of truth, and most consoling and refreshing it is to the true believer. The scout, who by this time was seated, examining into the state of his rifle with a species of parental assiduity, now looked up at the other in a displeasure that he did not affect to conceal, roughly interrupting further speech. "'Doctrine and no doctrine,' said the sturdy woodsman. "'Tis the belief of knaves and the curse of an honest man. "'I can credit that yonder Huron was to fall by my hand, "'for with mine own eyes I have seen it. "'But nothing short of being a witness will cause me to think "'he has met with any reward or that Chingachgook there "'will be condemned at the final day. "'You have no warranty for such an audacious doctrine "'nor any covenant to support it.' cried David, who was deeply tinctured with the subtle distinctions which in his time, and more especially in his province, had been drawn around the beautiful simplicity of revelation by endeavouring to penetrate the awful mystery of the divine nature, supplying faith by self-sufficiency, and by consequence involving those who reasoned from such human dogmas in absurdities and doubt. Your temple is reared on the sands, and the first tempest will wash away its foundation. I demand your authorities for such an uncharitable assertion." Like other advocates of a system, David was not always accurate in his use of terms. 
Name chapter and verse in which of the holy books do you find language to support you? Book, repeated Hawkeye with singular and ill-concealed disdain. Do you take me for a whimpering boy at the apron string of one of your old gals, and this good rifle on my knee for the feather of a goose's wing, my ox's horn for a bottle of ink, and my leathern pouch for a cross-barred handkerchief to carry my dinner? Book! Ha! Ah, what if such as I, who am a warrior of the wilderness, though a man without a cross to do with books? I never read but in one, and the words that are written there are too simple and too plain to need much schooling, though I may boast that of forty long and hard-working years. "'What call you the volume?' said David, misconceiving the other's meaning. "'Tis open before your eyes,' returned the scout, "'and he who owns it is not a niggard of its use. "'I have heard it said that there are men who read in books "'to convince themselves there is a God. "'I know not, but man may so deform his works in the settlement "'as to leave that which is so clear in the wilderness "'a matter of doubt among traders and priests. "'If any such there be, and he will follow me from sun to sun "'through the windings of the forest,' He shall see enough to teach him that he is a fool, and that the greatest of his folly lies in striving to rise to the level of one he can never equal, be it in goodness or be it in power. The instant David discovered that he battled with a disputant who imbibed his faith from the lights of nature, as chewing all subtleties of doctrine, he willingly abandoned a controversy from which he believed neither profit nor credit was to be derived. While the scout was speaking— he had also seated himself, and producing the ready little volume and the iron-rimmed spectacles, he prepared to discharge a duty which nothing but the unexpected assault he had received in his orthodoxy could have so long suspended. He was, in truth, a minstrel of the western continent, of a much later day, certainly, than those gifted bards who formerly sang the profane renown of baron and prince, but after the spirit of his own age and country." and he was now prepared to exercise the cunning of his craft in celebration of, or rather in thanksgiving for, the recent victory. He waited patiently for Hawkeye to cease. Then, lifting his eyes, together with his voice, he said aloud, "'I invite you, friends, to join in praise for this signal deliverance from the hands of barbarians and infidels to the comfortable and solemn tones of the tune called Northampton.' He next named the page and verse where the rhymes selected were to be found, and applied the pitch-pipe to his lips with the decent gravity that he had been wont to use in the temple. This time he was, however, without any accompaniment, for the sisters were just then pouring out those tender effusions of affection which have been already alluded to. Nothing deterred by the smallness of his audience, which, in truth, consisted only of the discontented scout, he raised his voice, commencing— and ending the sacred song without accident or interruption of any kind. Hawkeye listened while he coolly adjusted his flint and reloaded his rifle. But the sounds, wanting the extraneous assistance of scene and sympathy, failed to awaken his slumbering emotions. Never minstrel, or by whatever more suitable name David should be known, drew upon his talents in the presence of more insensible auditors, though considering the singleness and sincerity of his motive, it is probable that no bard of profane song ever uttered notes that ascended so near to that throne where all homage and praise is due. The scout shook his head, and muttering some unintelligible words, among which throat and Iroquois were alone audible, he walked away to collect and to examine into the state of the captured arsenal of the Hurons. In this office he was now joined by Chingachgook, who found his own as well as the rifle of his son among the arms. Even Hayward and David were furnished with weapons, nor was ammunition wanting to render them all effectual. When the foresters had made their selection and distributed their prizes, the scout announced that the hour had arrived when it was necessary to move. By this time the song of Gamut had ceased, and the sisters had learned to still the exhibition of their emotions. Aided by Duncan and the younger Mohican, the two latter descended the precipitous sides of that hill which they had so lately ascended under so very different auspices, and whose summit had so nearly proved the scene of their massacre. At the foot they found the Narragansetts browsing the herbage of the bushes, and, having mounted, they followed the movements of a guide who, in the most deadly straits, had so often proved himself their friend. The journey was, however, short— Hawkeye, leaving the blind path that the Hurons had followed, turned short to his right, and entering the thicket, he crossed a babbling brook and halted in a narrow dell under the shade of a few water-elms. Their distance from the base of the fatal hill was but a few rods, and the steeds had been serviceable only in crossing the shallow stream. The scout and the Indians appeared to be familiar with the sequestered place where they now were, for leaning their rifles against the trees, 
they commenced throwing aside the dried leaves and opening the blue clay out of which a clear and sparkling spring of bright glancing water quickly bubbled. The white man then looked about him, as though seeking for some object which was not to be found as readily as he expected. "'Them careless imps, the Mohawks, with their Tuscarora and Onondaga brethren, have been here slaking their thirst,' he muttered, "'and the vagabonds have thrown away the gourd. This is the way with benefits when they are bestowed on such disremembering hounds. Here has the Lord laid his hand in the midst of the howling wilderness for their good, and raised a fountain of water from the bowels of the earth that might laugh at the richest shop of apothecaries where in all the colonies. And see, the knaves have trodden in the clay and deformed the cleanliness of the place as though they were brute beasts instead of human men. Uncas silently extended toward him the desired gourd, which the spleen of Hawkeye had hitherto prevented him from observing on a branch of an elm. Filling it with water, he retired a short distance to a place where the ground was more firm and dry. Here he coolly seated himself, and after taking along an apparently a grateful draught, he commenced a very strict examination of the fragments of food left by the Hurons which had hung in a wallet on his arm. "'Thank you, lad,' he continued, returning the empty gourd to Uncas. Now we will see how these rampaging Hurons lived when outlying in ambushments. Look at this. The varlets know the better pieces of the deer, and one would think they might carve and roast a saddle equal to the best cook in the land, but everything is raw, for the Iroquois are thorough savages. Uncas, take my steel and kindle a fire. A mouthful of a tender boil will give nature a helping hand after so long a trail. Hayward, perceiving that their guides now set about their repast in sober earnest, assisted the ladies to alight, and placed himself at their side, not unwilling to enjoy a few moments of grateful rest after the bloody scene he had just gone through. While the culinary process was in hand, curiosity induced him to inquire into the circumstances which had led to their timely and unexpected rescue. "'How is it that we see you so soon, my generous friend?' he asked, and without aid from the garrison of Edward." Had we gone to the bend in the river, we might have been in time to rake the leaves over your bodies, but too late to have saved your scalps, coolly answered the scout. No, no, instead of throwing away strength and opportunity by crossing to the fort, we lay by under the bank of the Hudson, waiting to watch the movements of the Hurons. You were then witnesses of all that passed? Not of all, for Indian sight is too keen to be easily cheated, and we kept close. A difficult matter it was, too, to keep this Mohican boy snug in the ambushment. Ha-ha! <laughs> Uncas, Uncas, your behavior was more like that of a curious woman than of a warrior on his scent. Uncas permitted his eyes to turn for an instant on the sturdy countenance of the speaker, but he neither spoke nor gave any indication of repentance. On the contrary, Hayward thought the manner of the young Mohican was disdainful, if not a little fierce, and that he suppressed passions that were ready to explode as much in compliment to the listeners as from the deference he usually paid to his white associate. "'You saw our capture?' Hayward next demanded. "'We heard it,' was the significant answer. "'An Indian yell is plain language to men who have passed their days in the woods. "'But when you landed we were driven to crawl like serpents beneath the leaves, "'and then we lost sight of you entirely until we placed eyes on you again, "'trust to the trees, and ready bound for an Indian massacre. "'Our rescue was the deed of providence. "'It was nearly a miracle that you did not mistake the path, "'for the Hurons divided, and each band had its horses.' Aye, there we were thrown off the scent, and might indeed have lost the trail had it not been for Uncas. We took the path, however, that led into the wilderness, for we judged and judged rightly that the savages would hold that course with their prisoners. But when we had followed it for many miles without finding a single twig broken, as I had advised, my mind misgave me, especially as all the footsteps had the Prince of Moccasins. "'Our captors had the precaution to see us shod like themselves,' said Duncan, raising a foot and exhibiting the buckskin he wore. "'Aye, t'was judgmatical, and like themselves, though we were too expert to be thrown from a trail by so common an invention. "'To what, then, are we indebted for our safety? "'To what, as a white man who has no taint of Indian blood, I should be ashamed to own? "'To the judgment of the young Mohican in matters which I should know better than he, but which I can now hardly believe to be true, though my own eyes tell me it is so. "'Tis extraordinary. Will you not name the reason?' "'Uncas was bold enough to say that the beasts ridden by the gentle ones,' continued Hawkeye, glancing his eyes, not without curious interest, on the fillies of the ladies, 
planted the legs of one side on the ground at the same time, which is contrary to the movements of all trotting four-footed animals of my knowledge except the bear. And yet here are horses that always journey in this manner, as mine own eyes have seen, and as their trail has shown for twenty long miles. "'Tis the merit of the animal. They come from the shores of Narragansett Bay in the small province of Providence Plantations, and are celebrated for their hardihood and the ease of this particular movement, though other horses are not unfrequently trained to the same. "'It may be, it may be,' said Hawkeye, who had listened with singular attention to this explanation, though I am a man who has the full blood of the whites, my judgment in deer and beaver is greater than in beasts of burden. Major Effingham has many noble chargers, but I have never seen one travel after such a sidling gait. True, for he would value the animals for very different properties. Still, is this a breed highly esteemed, and, as you witness, much honored with the burdens it is often destined to bear? The Mohicans had suspended their operations about the glimmering fire to listen, and— when Duncan had done, they looked at each other significantly, the father uttering the never-failing exclamation of surprise. The scout ruminated like a man digesting his newly acquired knowledge, and once more stole a glance at the horses. "'I dare to say there are even stranger sights to be seen in the settlements,' he said at length. "'Nature is sadly abused by man when he once gets the mastery, but go sidling or go straight. Uncas had seen the movement, and their trail led us on to the broken bush.' The outer branch near the prince of one of the horses was bent upward as a lady breaks a flower from its stem, but all the rest were ragged and broken down, as if the strong hand of a man had been tearing them. So I concluded that the cunning varmints had seen the twig bent and had torn the rest to make us believe a buck had been feeling the boughs with his antlers. I do believe your sagacity did not deceive you, for some such thing occurred. That was easy to see, added the scout, in no degree conscious of having exhibited any extraordinary sagacity and a very different matter it was from a waddling horse. It then struck me the Mingos would push for this spring, for the knaves well know the virtue of its waters. "'Is it then so famous?' demanded Hayward, examining with a more curious eye the secluded dell with its bubbling fountain, surrounded as it was by earth of a deep, dingy brown. "'Few redskins who travel south and east of the Great Lakes but have heard of its qualities. Will you taste for yourself?' Hayward took the gourd and after swallowing a little of the water, threw it aside with grimaces of discontent. The scout laughed in his silent but heartfelt manner, and shook his head with vast satisfaction. Aha! You want the flavor that one gets by habit. The time was when I liked it as little as yourself. But I have come to my taste, and I now crave it as a deer does the licks. Your high-spiced wines are not better liked than a redskin relishes this water, especially when his nature is ailing. "'But Uncas has made his fire, and it is time we think of eating, "'for our journey is long and all before us.' "'Many of the animals of the American forests resort to these spots "'where salt springs are found. "'These are called licks, or salt licks in the language of the country "'from the circumstance that the quadruped is often obliged to lick the earth "'in order to obtain the saline particles. "'These licks are great places of resort with the hunters "'who waylay their game near the paths that lead to them.' Interrupting the dialogue by this abrupt transition, the scout had instant recourse to the fragments of food which had escaped the veracity of the Hurons. A very summary process completed the simple cookery when he and the Mohicans commenced their humble meal with the silence and characteristic diligence of men who ate in order to enable themselves to endure great and unremitting toil. When this necessary and happily grateful duty had been performed— each of the foresters stooped and took a long and parting draught at that solitary and silent spring, around which and its sister's fountains, within fifty years, the wealth, beauty, and talents of a hemisphere were to assemble in throngs in pursuit of health and pleasure. Then Hawkeye announced his determination to proceed. The sisters resumed their saddles. Duncan and David grasped their rifles and followed on footsteps, the scout leading the advance and the Mohicans bringing up the rear. The whole party moved swiftly through the narrow path toward the north, leaving the healing waters to mingle unheeded with the adjacent brooks and the bodies of the dead to fester on the neighboring mount without the rites of sepulture, a fate but too common to the warriors of the woods to excite either commiseration or comment. Note. The scene of the foregoing incidents is on the spot where the village of Boston now stands, one of the two principal watering places of America. The end of chapter 12 of The Last of the Mohicans.